Okay, I think we are, okay, I see the little record button. We are, we are rolling. Okay, hi everybody and thanks for tuning in. Uh, today we have a very special episode with Dr. Rashawn Achal. I feel like I just butchered that again, even though we- That's close enough. <laughs> we just had the conversation, okay. Um, so, like my other guests, you are going to uh, ComSciCon Canada, or not really traveling to it, but you're going to be attending it virtually. Yep. Um, where are you going to be attending it from? Where, where do you study? What do you do? What is, what is your deal? <laughs> I will be probably attending it from right here in Edmonton, Alberta. So I have the least amount of traveling. Would have been a three or four hour flight otherwise. Um, yeah, so I was working at the U of A, finishing up my PhD. I just convocated last Friday, so that was interesting. That was virtual too. Um, yeah, first in over a century at the U of A. Uh, yeah, so what I was studying during my PhD was the fabrication and design of atomic scale electronics for ultra low power computing, high density memory storage, things like that. And so what the things we were doing is um, using this very sharp tip of a scanning tunneling microscope, so a very special microscope, and we were moving around individual atoms to try and build these tiny little circuits. Okay. As, uh... yeah. Is the image behind you an experimental image of some sort? Yes, I made that. So each one of these little dots are hydrogen atoms. And then the uh, big dot there is where we remove the hydrogen atom to leave behind what's known as the quantum dot. So that can store up to two electrons. And then we can start to pattern these structures from these quantum dots. That's really cool. Yeah. Um, so maybe without getting too detailed into how uh, your microscope works, what, what do the colors signify? Um, charges or? Oh, you... yeah. So uh, the main way a scanning tunnel microscope works is essentially just a height map. So this is, uh, red would be the highest here, blue would be the lowest. Uh, so you can see that uh, these atoms are perceived as higher. In reality, it's at all one flat plane, but the charges work how the height is perceived. So I, I won't get into that too much. But basically, it's like an airplane flying over land at a fixed height and you can kind of map out a topography. That's what the colors mean. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so you, you defended a little while ago, you convocated and you were telling me that you're now uh, kind of doing similar work, um, but in sort of a, a more industry-esque application. Yep. Um, so it's great actually. Uh, during my PhD, my supervisor, has a spin-off company based on this atomic scale electronic uh, idea. And I was able to start working for him. So it was very seamless. Basically everything I was doing from grad school just transitioned into um, a working position. That's really cool. Nice. Yeah, because yeah, finding a job I think sounds a little scary. <laughs> yeah, especially right now. Yeah. Um, was your supervisor, like how, how old is this uh, startup company that your supervisor has? Did uh, I think it had started just before I started in the group, so okay. maybe 2013-ish, yeah. And I, I started working with them quite a bit sort of during the beginning of my PhD. Yeah. Was that um, like a conscious decision when you were choosing supervisors, the, the startup aspect? Like, uh... Oh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, that's one of the things that sold me is that he had very uh, practical focused research and that there was sort of this whole entrepreneurial vibe going on. That's cool. Yeah. Very uh, shrewd decision. That's a, <laughs> smart on your part. Um, yeah, that's really cool. And so, I mean, you're using microscopes, so it's a experimental type stuff that you're doing application driven. Um, is there like a, what, what would you call this area of physics that you study? Uh, I think the best blanket term would just be nanotechnology. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Nanophysics. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, but that's not what this conference is about. And I, I feel like this is the segue I've been using every single time. We'll, we'll talk about your stuff and they'll say, but. But that's, yeah, that's not the interesting part. Yeah. <laughs> that's not why we're here. Yeah. Um, although I'm, I'm sure we're going to find that there is overlap, but uh, science communication, um, has that always been a uh, aspect of your uh, PhD or, or science edification that you've you valued or is this like a, a newer thing like how do you how do you rank communicating science 
is it like a career um, focus or is it more of like a, I need to be good at communicating because I want to be a scientist. Does that make sense? Did I say that in a reason? Yeah, I, 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 think, I think I get what you're getting at. Uh, that, that, that's an interesting question. So if I really think about it, I think science communication really came about as uh, it was emphasized incredibly during my undergrad. And the only way to pass certain classes was to be an effective communicator. Hmm. Uh, so I think that was the strength of my program was that we had to really, really focus on breaking down these complicated topics. And then we started going out to conferences, like little undergrad conferences, or um, there's the CAP conference, which is the Canadian Association of Physics. And I was just finishing up my fourth year the first time I got to go. And I, I gave a talk and I won money. And I was like, oh, this, this is fun. And people seem to really be engaged with the whole idea of how I was presenting the science. And then from there, it just became sort of this um, proofing ground, I guess, of being able, I always find if you, if you can explain it to somebody who has no idea what you're talking about, then you probably have a decent understanding of it yourself. Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting point. So I guess uh, to put a finer point on uh, the question I was driving at is some people see science communication as like, that's the career path that they want to take. They want to be a communicator, mm -hmm. but yeah. it sounds like you're approaching it from a, I want to be very good at science. And part of that is communicating to other people. Um, ah, okay. Yeah. That's, that's a different question than I was answering. Uh, no, I would, I would definitely consider it as a career. Okay. Uh, okay. No, I, I like science quite a bit, but I also found over the last, couple of years especially with some of the opportunities that I've had to sort of do psych home uh, that I could really see myself doing it as a career. Mm -hmm. That's part of why I was uh, wanting to come to this conference was just to sort of meet people, see what kind of opportunities were out there. Yeah, um, from the people I've talked to, um, a lot of them are going into it without too much of a, a plan or like a, a goal, just sort of exploring what science communication is about. Yeah. Um, and that sounds kind of where, where you're coming from. Eh? Yeah, pretty much. Uh, do you have any sort of SciComm projects or initiatives that you take part in? I, I feel like there's a lot of opportunity to uh, get involved with other people's things. Have, have you started anything? Is there anything that you take part in? Um, yeah, there are a couple things. So one of the things I started using Twitter uh, after I applied for the SciComm uh, workshop because one of the guys who's an organizer he recommended like yeah you know Twitter is an important thing to have as a scientist so uh, I took the plunge and I found it pretty weird to be honest uh, but my uh, partner shared with me some guy who was trying to start a global science show uh, just sort of during the pandemic to introduce people around the world to different types of science so I started uh, joining in on that making what I call 90 seconds of nano science videos uh, so I think I have three or four. There's a new one coming this Friday. Okay, cool. So I've had a lot of fun with that, just trying to take uh, interesting topics in physics and breaking them down into very simple 90-second chunks. Yeah, that's an awesome initiative. Is that on YouTube or is that? An I, it's on Twitter only right now. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, which uh, maybe is not the best medium for posting videos and having people find them, but. Yeah, I don't know. Uh... Uh, the 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 types of things you can upload to Twitter are pretty uh pretty yeah. vast and expansive. I guess like if it drops down in the feed, yeah, it's a little bit exactly. harder to find. I think um transitioning to YouTube probably wouldn't be too tough, but yeah, yeah, my social media game is a little weak. Not gonna <laughs> lie. <laughs> yeah, interesting that uh, I feel like the 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 SciComm Twitter is like a huge area it seems like yeah. people are very well established people can have like full careers on twitter at this point that's astounding <laughs> have you uh Good have you them. found yeah have you found anybody in uh sort of your area of research that has a particularly strong t twitter game not not specifically actually it's, it's interesting i think the majority of people are really in the biological sciences or chemistry physics mm. As a whole, I find there's not very much of a culture of psychom encouragement. Yeah, that's fair. Actually, that's a that kind of brings back. I was going to ask you about um, your undergrad. Uh, it sounded pretty unique that you had so many opportunities 
for communication. That's, that's something that yeah. I didn't experience. Um, is that like a very conscious effort, do you think, by your university? Like, was that led by any profs in particular? Yeah, our, our, the professor who was doing the thesis class. So it was mandatory whether you were an honor student or not in physics at the U of C to do a thesis. So there was like an honors thesis, which was an eight month project or regular thesis, which is a four month project. And you had to defend it uh, regardless. So there was that whole aspect of the only way to get a good grade in this class is to give a good presentation. And uh, yeah, so his, his whole motto was, I want people knowing students coming out of this university are like good researchers, good effective communicators. And I, I think that paid off a lot for a lot of my friends and I who had to suffer through that class. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, a lot of the people I talked to say they came, it wasn't always taught, they had to look for their own resources for science communication. It was never really pushed on them. Um, it's refreshing to hear that, that it was actually made a priority. Yeah. Um, yeah, it wasn't so much in the context of like outreach and SciComm, but more just communicate your science to other scientists. Right. Yeah. I think my undergrad thesis supervisor, uh, his recommendation for presentations was to spend as little time as possible creating them because you're only going to be presenting for five to 10 minutes and then it's done and you never oh, go wow. back to it again. So <laughs> Don't worry about it. <laughs> oh, no, man. I got so much mileage out of my uh, thesis talk for my undergrad. I, I think I must have presented it like 15 times. <laughs> Take it on the world tour. Yeah. Where did um, you... It was actually one of the presentations I gave at the U of A when I came as a prospective student. Oh, wow. Where did, yeah. you, uh, where did you do your undergrad? Uh, so not very far from here in Calgary at the U of C. Ah, okay. Okay. Cool. Yeah, my uh, my current supervisor is very. Uh, we put a lot of time and effort into our presentations now. I <laughs> I learned a heck of a lot through that process. Um, have you ever taken part in like? Uh, have you heard of like the three minute thesis competition and things like that? That seems like yeah. something you'd be interested in. <laughs> I've I've done it. Okay. Yeah, I made it. I made it to the finals, but that was that's a, that's a whole different story. Yeah. Um. Yeah, basically, I, I made it. I had a good talk going in, but they asked me to change a few aspects of it just to like be more in line with how they felt the judging was going to go. Okay. And I didn't have the time to maybe implement the changes and practice as well. So I actually forgot what I said, like on stage in front of 400 people. <laughs> that, was, that was something. That was a very, that was a very humbling communication experience oh man that sounds terrifying <laughs> yeah. uh, my friends don't let me live it down but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah it seems like it's a pretty good uh thing to do like for practice i, I don't know do, do you think there's a lot of transferable um do you think you get a lot out of doing a three-minute thesis or is it mostly uh just an I, think, exercise? I think there are a lot of merit there's a lot of merit to it but i think there are also at least in the way that it's currently structured, some flaws um, that is really geared towards sensationalizing your science and putting like, no, yeah, not necessarily like the correct emphasis on it. Like um, one of the girls who I saw present, she had a great um, topic, but she framed it in like, we're curing this disease, but her research was actually on the policies related to how the treatment of that disease works. But like, if you were just listening to the three minutes, you'd be thinking her research was focused on uh, direct sort of biomedical research applications. And uh, even in the ways that I was asked to sort of change my talk, it was more to the point of being like, yes, new technology coming like tomorrow in your phones. Um, mm. But that said, the, the exercise in and of itself was great, like yeah. having to apply it. But I mean, maybe without that sensational aspect, I think it would have been better. Yeah. I I also, I've never participated myself, but I always feel like uh, certain areas of research kind of have a, an advantage. Yeah. Or some areas are, are harder to craft the kind of story they're looking for. Oh, yeah. I think things with the human element is just much more relatable off the bat. Like, yeah. you know, most people have experienced someone with cancer in their life. 
versus, you know, you don't have to think about what an electron is like 99% of your day. Yeah. But that 1% though. That 1%. You better know what an electron is. You, you got to know. Yeah. Uh, cool. Yeah. Um, what, so when did you, when did you do the three minute thesis? Do you, Ooh. a couple of years ago or? Uh, was it 2016 or 2017? Three minute thesis. I think 2016. Oh, okay so you've come yeah. a long way since <laughs> yeah i think i think i'd have a much better um well i had more time i think it came down to i did i had to choose between practicing or classes yeah and i can tell you grad physics classes are a bit of a drag <laughs> they're hard <laughs> it's not easy <laughs> nope nope <laughs> it's uh i don't know the the feeling of relief when you finally take your last one it's, uh, oh, yeah. it's, it's, it's unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> it was much more real that aspect than, uh, than getting over the comprehensive exam I found. Oh really? Yeah. I don't know. Candidacy for me was like the biggest, um, like fear of grad school. Cause like, you know, you can fail a class and you can kind of take another class and still continue. But if you fail your candidacy, you're kind of out. Yeah, that's true. Um, that was one of the fears like, going into grad school at all, thinking that I probably wouldn't be able to get through that part. So maybe I shouldn't even start. Huh. But yeah. uh, I don't know, my experience with it ended up being pretty positive. Um, it was just an opportunity to learn about the field and, and read books. Yeah, I, I think it really, which is unfortunate, it just comes down to your committee. I had a fantastic committee. So my yeah. candidacy was actually like, I was stressed. They didn't seem very stressed. And then it, it was just over. and they seemed satisfied and I left with most of my dignity intact. <laughs> but I know other people that go in and they're just, they're pretty much brought to the edge of tears. And just because it's some weird academic hazing ritual. Yeah, it really is just hazing. I, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Um, and it, I guess it depends like how it's done. A, a few years before I started, my school turned it into uh, you're only asked about things related to your research and you like oh, okay. you negotiate what textbooks are included etc yeah um, but I've heard of ones where it's like it's three three-hour written exams on like, quantum mechanics classical mechanics and like e &M or something like that oh, wow oh yeah. that's gross no ours ours was just uh, open-ended um, no time limit either but all purely oral yeah yeah so no no written portion other than like a 20 page document, like detailing your research plans and your current work. Yeah. I guess the, uh, the SciComm practice definitely helps with the, the oral component of these exams. Yeah. Not so much like being able to bullshit, but you know, having the confidence to, to not get too phased or, you know, how to say, I don't know, but this is how I would think about it. You know, yeah. those sort of techniques. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So, so this conference uh, requires a writing thing. You had to submit a, a writing piece. Yeah. Uh, what kind of experience do you have with writing? Was this a, a new thing for you or? Uh, yeah. Writing something tailored for purely the general public is not something I've done a lot of. Uh -huh. um, yeah. Like with papers and things for academic audiences, I've, try and put a lot of effort, same with like reports, but an actual piece that someone would want to read, not, not so much. Uh, I, had, I had a really cool opportunity also in 2016. Um, you know, Jay Ingram from uh, yeah. Daily Planet? Yeah, he contacted my supervisor with a, a problem that he wanted like to discuss and solve about how many times you could fold a piece of paper. Okay. But my supervisor was too busy, uh, so he asked the grad students, like, hey, guys, like, this is Jay, um, can you help him? And I was like, oh, of course, like, I grew up watching this guy on TV. So I, I wrote up a, a little piece about how many times you could fold a piece of paper, what the theoretical limit would be. And he actually blended that into um, one of the chapters of his book. And so my name appears in there. It's like, Roshan uh, uh, took this a formula and um, blah, blah, oh, blah. Wow up with the number 18 for how many times you could fold like a single atom sheet so like he yeah i think that was my biggest experience in writing something that would eventually be public 
Yeah, that's really cool, actually. Uh, did, is this something that you had thought about beforehand, or did you? Uh... No, no, I just, uh, <laughs> I just jumped on that. I, you know, grad school, you have a lot of flexibility in your time, so I'm like, I'll, I'll just. I'll dedicate a day to learning about paper folding. Like, yeah, that's sweet. <laughs> it actually turns out to be super interesting. So, yeah, I, I guess initially I would have imagined that the surface area of the paper would come into play, but I'm guessing it doesn't really. No, it's purely thickness. Yeah. So every time you fold it, you kind of get this exponential doubling of thickness. So it's really how much material can curve around each time. Right. Okay. So then the limiting thing will be like, uh, like inter like atomic spacing and that curvature around the, the final end there. Yeah. So I think the calculation I did was a paper, like an eight and a half by 11, um, sized graphene sheet. Okay. Uh, so like one atom thick carbon. And then I think it was either 18 or 19 times you could fold it. It was like the theoretical maximum. Okay. Interesting. For some yeah. reason, the number 11 stuck in my head for, I don't know, I feel like maybe it's been pub published somewhere that 11 would be it, based on some approximation or whatever, but. Uh, yeah, I think what, like regular paper with um, the standard fold, turn 90 degrees fold is like eight, seven or eight. And then okay. there's one I think somebody did with toilet paper roll where they keep folding it end over end. Ah, so, okay. Right, and in your case, the the single atom thick is the thinnest possible paper that could ever be created. Yeah, in in, in theory, with right. what we have currently available. Right. So then, your number would be the the ultimate with what yeah. is available. Yep, for like a standard eight and a half by eleven sheet. Yeah, that's cool. Those, yeah. those are the kind of physics problems I love to read about. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. It's like, um, uh, sorry, go. Oh, no, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, my supervisor had a chance to work on something like that uh, a couple of years ago. The uh, interleaved phone book problem. Yeah. I don't know exactly how he and collaborators got involved in, in answering this question, but it's like uh, the one where you interleave two big, thick books. Have you heard of this? No. So, yeah, you... you you put them, you mash them together so that it's like page from one book, page of other book, and you keep going back and forth. Yeah. Um, and then if you grab each book by the spine and try to separate it just by pulling it, uh, it's incredibly hard. Like you can tell, yeah. uh, you can like lift a bus by, by this thing. Oh, I think I have seen it. They've like had it between two cars and yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it ends up being like a, a friction and like, basically a friction plus geometry problem similar to the the bending angle type thing you end up getting these weird um shapes that the paper makes that causes extra friction but yeah that's uh that's why i'm in yeah, science those, baby those, like everyday everyday kind of accessible science things are cool yeah one of the, things with the paper thing that i learned is uh, a high school student actually solved this problem uh, it was a girl named Brittany. i forget her last name but she did it as like an extra credit high school project and her science teachers didn't believe her at first. And then somehow it made its way to somebody who could verify it. And yeah. So she is associated with the solution to this problem now. Cool. Yeah. So high school kid, pretty great. Yeah. Yeah. I guess there's all sorts of like little real world things that maybe just have slipped under the radar that are accessible to people. Yeah. Cool. So, uh, so for this writing thing, um, what did you end up picking? Can I, can I get a, a spoiler, a little teaser? Yeah. Um, well, I wrote something about gen the general like difficulty of physics, science, com or like science communication. Then I hated it. But <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the organizer, uh, who I'm sure you got an email from too, um, when she was saying like, you know, make sure to submit your psychom piece. It's very open ended. I submitted a children's story. I'm like, oh. I, a bunch of my friends are having babies in the next little while or have had babies. And I thought, oh, it'd be kind of cool to write them a children's book. So I'd actually started a project uh, four or five months ago doing that and I haven't come back to it. And her email made me think like, oh, actually I could, I could use that. So I wrote three short children's stories um, for the Psycom writing piece. That's so cool. So they're each like 
200 ish words and like little rhymes one is about organelles in a cell okay uh, one is about photons like how fast they go and the other one is about acids and bases so That's one for sweet. physics huh i'm ex i'm gonna have to dig through the uh <laughs> yeah take, take a peek if you want I, i'm okay with that yeah i haven't looked to see if uh, we're in each other's editing groups i i've been really <laughs> bad about getting on that but uh yeah. I'll definitely have to find yours anyway. My calendar and I have not opened that folder since. <laughs> no. <laughs> we got plenty of time. Yep. <laughs> that's, that's cool. Um, yeah. Why, what, what put you on the, the idea of just like having your friends and stuff have kids put that idea in your head or. Yeah. Like I, I wasn't sure what to get them as gifts. Like, you know, I'm, I was still like deep into grad school. Babies weren't very forefront of my mind. So I yeah. was thinking like what would be a nice way of showing them like I care and also giving them something cool that might help their children learn some science at some point. Yeah, that's rad. Yeah. Um, any idea what like the the children's book market is like? Like, <laughs> is there like I a have, I have no idea. <laughs> okay. Uh, I got, it was hilarious. Have you ever seen those like quantum mechanics for babies books? Yeah, yeah. I actually haven't read one, but uh, I've seen that they I, exist. Yeah, I was gifted that and Newtonian physics for babies for my candidacy study material by somebody in my group. Okay. That was hilarious. So they're like, here you go. <laughs> so I, I think there's some type of market for it. But even, even if not, as long as I can make it for my like friends, I'm, I'm happy with that. Yeah, for sure. I, I I got to imagine with like baby Einstein type stuff out there that like, yeah, this is something people would want. In theory, you'd, it depends how big the market of biologists who want bio-based stories for their babies are. Yeah, I don't know. It would just be a nice thing to to share around too. Oh yeah, absolutely. Cool. Yeah. So one day, you know, if I have extra time, I'll find somebody who can draw and maybe get it illustrated and. Yeah. yeah, that'd be awesome. Maybe you can well, find what it looks like at the end of the workshop. <laughs> yeah, maybe you can find somebody at the the workshop. That's an yeah, that would be amazing. That's a. I would be surprised if you found if you didn't find somebody who is uh, artistically inclined. It seems yeah. to go somewhat hand in hand. Cool. Well, yeah, um, I lack that talent. <laughs> I can draw a free body diagram, like a really good one, but. <laughs> Those are important. Yeah. Uh, we uh, we were trying to, so as I was writing these first year labs, we were trying to come up with creative ways to get them to practice drawing free body diagrams. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> you can only be so creative with like a box if you- They're going you, a ball. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. They're They're good though, I guess. Super important. Yeah, I, I don't think I've drawn a free body diagram in like 10 years. Mm. I want to learn more about uh, Feynman diagrams. Is that something that you interact with, with uh, no. your research? Okay. Uh, one of my friends is a theorist who I think is very familiar with Feynman diagrams, but I, I definitely don't use them. Yeah. I think it's more of a theory tool. Yeah. I think it's like a, supposed to be a, a convenient way to solve partial differential equations or something. Yeah. I don't know. Another episode, another topic for another time. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. So, so I guess our deadline to submit our drafts is already gone, uh, which means the conference is coming up shortly. Um, are you? What else do we have? We have a poster. That's a, a possibility. Are you preparing anything for that? Or uh, I wasn't actually sure what they wanted for a poster. Yeah, I, I don't. Mean, yeah. <laughs> I think it was for like initiatives you've undertaken for SciComm or, or something, not like actual research-based poster. So I, I don't think I have anything for that. Yeah, I, I'm thinking that maybe they would also accept initiatives you would like to do. So <laughs> if yeah. I have time, I might, I might try to pitch something, but uh, I don't know. Excited to it's see a lot of work to make a poster, to be honest. Yeah, it seemed like they wanted it designed as like a series of five tweets though. I don't know if oh, you look at the, uh, the description. They asked for like five pictures with Twitter friendly comment. Mm. So no, I, you're right. I did read that. That's interesting. Yeah, I was thinking that's not really a poster in my mind, but 
Just put poster in quotes. Virtual poster. Yeah, I guess you could print out the tweet if you if you absolutely wanted to. I mean, I've seen people print out their entire posters in like eight and that's, a half hours. Yeah. That's true, yeah. <laughs> I've actually oh. never had to make a poster. Really? Yeah. I've only I ever did... Them, Sorry, go. Well, I find them way harder than talks. A lot of people like giving posters because they don't have to stand up in front of um, a crowd and be like judged, I guess. But posters are so much work. Like I, I admire people that go the poster route all the time. Yeah. Underrated, I think, or underappreciated, perhaps. Yeah. Because yeah, good poster design. Like there's a lot of bad poster design, but when you see a really good, like well laid out, tiny blocks of text. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. Like this is something I could actually put up, put up on the wall. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> cool. Well, um, let's see. I, what, that's pretty much all I had uh, in terms of questions, but. Um, It'd be really cool to catch up after the conference if you're free and, and see, you know, yeah, it should be. if anything has changed or if you had any great takeaways. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I'm, I'm sad we're not going to get to meet in person. Yeah, it's a little, a little unfortunate, but uh, yeah, I'm, you know. we'll I'm, make I'm do. glad it's going ahead in some way. Mm -hmm. like, I know one of the organizers and I think he's, they're doing a, a lo all that all the they can to make sure it's a good conference still. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it, I'm sure it'll be good. Um, but yeah, well, during any, the time, I think it's been nice. Just, just meeting someone sort of face to face and one on one is it's just a good way of, of meeting. Yeah. Yeah. This has been nice for, certainly for me, this has been a pretty much a selfish project, but, uh, <laughs> I'll start releasing them and maybe, uh, other people will get something out of it too. Yeah. No, I'm glad you're doing it. I guess it's a cool idea. Thanks. Maybe I'll make a poster about it. <laughs> <laughs> Five tweets or less, though. Yeah, true. Yikes. All right. Well, <laughs> well, thanks so much for talking to me. Is there anything that you want to sort of plug or anybody we should check out or advertise? Uh, not on top of my head. <laughs> okay. I'll certainly link to, uh, to your stuff, your 90, 90 seconds. I was going to call it 90 minutes of... Uh... <laughs> maybe, maybe one day. I don't know if I have 90 minutes in me to do nanoscience. Yeah, it, it actually takes a shocking amount of time to make 90 seconds worth of video. Like I, I have a newfound appreciation for people that make content as a living. Like, holy crap. Yeah, I guess, uh, I mean, if you have to pack the information into like 90 seconds of, of good, well edited. Yeah, I think the one we were doing this weekend was about is about like magnets and magnetic metals. Mm -hmm. And it took, it took about an hour or so to write um dialogue that worked i think in 90 seconds then another like hour or so to gather all the material and props and then another two hours to film it not wow. to put it all together still so you, it, it's like five or six hours worth for 90 seconds of video yeah i guess like when every bit of speech has to be scripted which i think it should be for for 90 seconds yeah that that takes quite a bit like this project yeah. here um Obviously, nothing was scripted. <laughs> I, the very minimal editing is going to go into it. <laughs> um, so it's kind of just like the, the time to do the thing. But uh, yeah. I think the, the shorter the timeline. Oh, yeah. But it's, it's been fun because it really makes you think about what's important and what somebody who has no background in science can get. Mm -hmm. the, one, the one, I don't know if you maybe if you'll have a chance to take a look after, but the one about LEDs I think is my favorite so far because that's, that was an experiment I saw during my undergrad and I've never been able to get it to work. Uh, basically you take an LED and you stick it in liquid nitrogen and you see the color change because the temperature changes the uh, band gap size. Oh, okay. And only some LEDs do it because of how uh, different LEDs are made and I could never find one that did and I finally got it and I was able to make a video about it and it's just it's there if I were like telling people about this experiment I'm like, there it is go look it only takes 90 seconds that's so cool I didn't yeah. I never actually thought about that that I mean it makes a lot of sense that you should be able to do that how did you get liquid nitrogen do you oh um, just have that at home or <laughs> yeah yeah pretty much <laughs> No, so our, our, uh, our microscope needs uh, constant cryogen supply. So we have liquid helium and liquid nitrogen. Okay. Like outside the door. 
Right. It's really a pain, to be honest. Uh, you have to go in every two days to fill the machine with fluids. Mm. So when you're when you're doing a bunch of experiments, there's really no such thing as a weekend. You're like every two days go in and fill. Wow, high maintenance. But I mean, like, how else are you going to take these the type of images you have behind you? He, yeah. He can, probably can't do it at room temperature. Or... Uh, you, you can take these images at room temperature, actually. So the STM was uh, room temperature based at when they first designed it. And there's still active research being done at room temperature. Oh, it's just okay. fabricating is quite a bit easier at low temperature because you kind of get this uncertainty in position of your tip with temperature so in mm -hmm. cold temperatures it's kind of locked there and you can remove single atoms at a time okay yeah that's kind of what i was imagining at uh at room temperature it might just be noisy but uh, uh no the, the image quality i mean somebody's gonna kick me for saying this but the image quality <laughs> is very comparable if you have a good enough machine okay so there there are groups around the world doing fabrication at room temperature with the exact same equipment and uh they just on a little bit of a coarser uh, scale. So we're removing one atom at a time. They're removing four to six atoms at a time. Right, okay. So it really depends what you want to do. So for us, we want to be very precise, one atom at a time, uh, perfect nanostructures. Other people are needing just coarser things. And so they don't have that uh, needy cryogen <laughs> problem. But I have liquid nitrogen at my disposal. So I, I love that. Yeah, that's right. Cool. Well, yeah, thanks so much for uh, for coming on and chatting with me. This is fun. Yeah, 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 thanks for having me. It was great. Yeah, I'll um I'll be doing some editing on this uh and I'll I'll just, I'll let you know when uh, it gets posted and you can invest I'll tweet and everything. It. One of my one of my few tweets. Sweet. Uh okay. yeah, if you if you think of anything that you'd like me to share, um feel free to just message me and I'll I'll add it into the show notes and stuff. I'll I'll put you in and your your ninety second stuff and uh, I don't know maybe maybe your your research group or sure yeah I mean if you need anything just let me know I do check my messages periodically <laughs> okay cool yeah that was nice meeting you yeah it was great meeting you too thanks so much yeah all right take care all right you too.